Good evening, everyone. I think we should get started. I want to welcome all of you to this very special evening. Uh, we will be glorifying the Lord with wonderful music. And if any of you were here last year to hear John Gross play, uh, you know how wonderful it will be. Um, he will really put, bring some wonderful sounds out of that organ. Um, he's going to be playing some selections from Handel's Messiah. So I'm going to read a few verses from Isaiah 40, if you would like to follow me in the Pew Bibles. <clears throat> comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all the, her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And then verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We ask that you would... Bless this night as we are gathered together to hear this special music, and that it will be for your glory alone. Thank you for sending your Son to die for us, and help us all to keep Christ in Christmas. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Again, I want to thank you all for coming, and now we have a surprise. You just just wait for a minute. We have a surprise. Oh. It's a delight to have you all here tonight. And uh, we have a very special surprise because although you may not recognize it, there's a former president with us here tonight who has had a very long relationship with um, Bible Presbyterian Church back in the days of Dr. McIntyre and uh, very involved in uh, the educational issues of this country. And so uh, tonight we want to give a special welcome because this is also that former president of the Women's Missionary Fellowship. That's her 90th birthday today, Shirley Lee. Shirley, will you stand up? We are going to sing Happy Birthday to Shirley Lee. All right. want to let you know there is a birthday cake on the table in the back that says happy 90th birthday Shirley Lee and so after the concert tonight you're all invited for refreshments out in the lobby. Suzanne. Okay I'm going to turn the program over to John Gross and his mother Debbie and they're going to um, give us some wonderful Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're going to sing a couple of hymns. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Keith McCoy will be leading us in two numbers, Hark the Herald Angels Sing and Joy to the World. Yes, in our celebration hymnals, if you turn to 277, we'll sing uh, the first and last verses of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's stand and sing together hymn 277.
may be seated. Turn over just a few pages to hymn 270. 270, Joy to the World. Let's sing the first and third verses. First and third verses, Joy to the World. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Good to see you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I just wanted to give uh, a few remarks just so that when you're listening to some of these pieces, I know uh, having a little insight always helped me when I was growing up listening to things. I thought it was really special to, to maybe hear some of what the composer was thinking when they were writing their music. Um, the first piece that I'm doing is uh, a very old uh, piece of French music from really like this early 1600s to mid 1600s is a very regal piece uh, it's a very large piece of music lots of reeds very loud and uh, to me it just sort of gives off that feeling of what it must have been like to be a shepherd just tending sheep and then out of nowhere seeing the heavens open up and angels just standing right in front of you. It must have been absolutely incredible. Um, so the first piece that I'm doing is that. The second, uh, and, I, and I made a mistake, I goofed, I forgot to send this to, uh, to uh, Suzanne. But the second piece is a total departure from that. It's very quiet, it's very reserved. The composer himself was actually blind. And as a result, the music is very colorful. Uh, if you listen carefully, you can sort of see light shimmering through a stained glass window. So uh, the second piece I, I'm going to be playing is called The Song of Peace. And the third piece is uh, by Bach. And I'll play the, the uh, chorale before his stylized version. A chorale is basically just a hymn, but in, in Lutheran times back in Bach's day. Uh, what he would do is have the choir sing a familiar hymn, and then he would sit down on the organ and play a more stylized version of that uh, for the congregation. So that's the third piece I'm playing, Savior of the Nations Come. Um, and in that piece, if you listen carefully, you can hear there's a lot of tension and, and there's a lot of angst. And what Bach is, is signifying there in his work is the tension between us as sinful man and him as holy God being made into man to take on flesh and to come into a sinful world and dwell among us. So you'll hear this tension of, of Christ and his regalness, his, his being the king of kings, but yet struggling here with us, sinful man. And you'll really hear this battle sort of back and forth between uh, those voice parts. The next set is some chorale preludes by uh, Johannes Brahms. It was a little bit later. Uh, Brahms was a romantic composer, so you'll hear a lot more stylistic uh, harmony in that particular set of, of music. The, the first one, Deck Thyself My Soul with Gladness, is a is a very typical Lutheran hymn that's done at this time of year. 
And it really is exactly what the title says it is. It's a very happy, glad piece, and it's talking about, of course, Christ becoming incarnate and coming and taking on man for us. And then the Lo, how our roses are blooming. I'm sure we all know that hymn, but Brahms took that and really stylized that and changed a lot of the harmony in it. In that, you'll get to hear the organ, the antiphonal organ, which will sound from the rear of the church. So it's sort of a dialogue between the front and the rear. And then the final piece in the first set is the adagio for strings, which I'm sure many of you have heard by Samuel Barber. But William Strickland arranged it for organ. And so it's just a fabulous arrangement. He did a really good job of getting all of the orchestration in there. And to me, that piece signifies great mystery, which, as we all know, this time of year with the virgin birth, with the incarnation of Christ, I couldn't think of anything more mysterious and wonderful and beautiful to end the first half with. Then the second half, my mom and I are going to be playing some selections from the Messiah, as Suzanne alluded to, both He Shall Feed His Flock and the Pastoral Symphony. So both of those, we'll get to hear that. And then if you didn't get a chance, when you came in right over there, what I'm going to do to kind of finish this thing up tonight is to select at random three Christmas hymns that you've chosen and just sort of meld them all together and do an improvisation and a montage on those. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. And to God be the glory.
All I can say is praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, John. Uh, at this time, we're going to uh, take an offering for the Missionary Society. This is a part of uh, our budget that we have each year that we give to the uh, to missions and to support our missions. We support the Independent Board for Home and Foreign Missions, uh, also uh, other missionaries that have been within our church body over the years, and we um, so give as you are able, and we'll just ask uh, Sandy and uh, Brit Brittany to come forward, please. Let's pray. Lord, we just give you praise and glory. We thank you so much for this time of year that we have a chance to put to memory and to set aside and to dwell on your word and the fact that you did come down onto this earth as a man, that, that you came and uh, sacrificed your life for our sins. We thank you for all these things. We thank you for the ability that we have to be able to support missions and support those that go out onto the fields and how ripe they are for harvest. We just th thank you and praise you for all these things. We pray for your blessings upon the rest of this time that we have together. In thy name, amen. Okay, it's your turn again. Let's turn our celebration hymnals to hymn 261. We'll be singing Away in the Manger. We'll sing all uh, the first and last verses. Please stand and let's sing together.
It's always a delight to move into the Christmas season and to see what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. We have illustration of that in the Gospel of Luke as we look at the beginning of the Christmas narrative in chapter 1. Tonight I want to compare an old man and a young woman. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 26 through 28, which is the story of the appearance of the angel to Mary. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Amen. Gracious Father, as we look tonight at faith versus doubt, at trust versus fear, at theology versus expectancy. We pray, Father, that you might help us to understand what you require of us, that we might learn to respond in the way that Mary responded, rather than the way that Zacharias responded, and thus to receive, though both received a blessing, receive a special blessing that comes from walking by faith. And so, Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The opening verses of this chapter, which I did not read tonight, describe for us a priest by the name of Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. When it says of the course of Abiah, or the course of Abias, there were 26 different divisions of the priesthood at the time of Christ. As you go through the ancient Jewish writings, they have various tractates which are gathered together into a sum called the Mishnah, which describes in great detail uh, what was going on at the time of Christ. In the sovereignty of God, he made sure that we would understand that 
by giving us these illuminating writings so that we would know what was happening and so that we would understand some things that they're not described for us in Scripture. And one of those is how the priests were divided so that each priest would have two weeks out of the year, out of those 26 courses or 26 divisions, to be able to serve in the temple in Jerusalem. But it also lets us know something else. At the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was born, there were 9,000 qualified priests per course. 9,000 qualified men between the ages of 30 and 50 who would be able to serve in the temple. For a man to be able to serve, there were only a limited number of slots available. One of those very special slots was being able at some point during that two-week period to offer the incense. Over the course of his life, Zacharias had probably never before had that slot because it was gained by casting of lots. And so here he is, an old man. Here he is, who's moved into the temple, and, and he's, he's going through the process and very excited about it. And the altar of incense, you recall, was the place where the prayers were lifted up before God. We see it that way in the book of Revelation. The prayers of the saints going up with the incense. And God knows what Zacharias' prayer has been all these years. He's prayed for a son, but he's never had a son. He's prayed for someone who would be able to follow in his steps, in his footsteps, and serve as a priest. But he has a barren wife. And so when the angel appears to him, the angel says, Zacharias, your prayers have been heard. What an excitement, what a thrill, what a joy that the very prayer that he wanted was the prayer for a son and the angel says, you'll receive that prayer. You're here at the altar of incense. Your prayer is being heard. As the incense goes up, God knows what's on your heart. He knows what you want. Your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, is going to bear a son. Here we have a man who had all the theological training. Here we have a man of the priestly line. Here we have a man who is married to a descendant of Aaron, the high priest. Here we have a man who has had all the theological training absolutely necessary. Here we have a man who serves in the temple at a key point in his life, sovereignly ordained by God, for the lot is cast into the lap, but the disposing thereof is of the Lord. That lot had been cast many times before, and Zacharias had been passed over because God wanted to wait until there was an impossible situation to prove himself strong. Here was a man who knew what the Bible said. Here was a man who was called to walk by faith. Here was a man who was given the answer to his prayer. Here's an old man who should have known that God hears and answers prayer. A man who had studied the Torah. A man who had studied the Nevi'im, the prophets. A man who had studied the Ketuvim, the writings. All his life probably had most of it memorized. Here was a man who the text tells us was righteous and his wife was righteous. But when the point of test came, he doubted. 
It's interesting because his words appear very much similar to those of Mary just a few verses later. But God hears not merely the words, God sees what's in the heart. And so when Zacharias says in verse 18, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. In other words, it doesn't matter that you're Gabriel. It doesn't matter that you stand in the presence of God, and the text tells us that he does. I'm old. How in the world can you do that with somebody who's old? My wife is old. How can you do that with an old woman who no longer can bear children and never was even when she was a young woman able to bear children? There's a challenge in his voice. And the angel replies to him and says, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. You should have been glad instead of questioning. And so he's dumb until the birth of John the Baptist. We move a few verses later and we see the contrast. A young virgin. Now which is more difficult? For an old woman to bear a child when she has a husband Old men can still be virile. Or for a virgin who has never known a man to bear a child. The contrast, on the one hand, the old man with all that theological training, all those years of memorizing the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. An old man who is actually standing in the temple at the altar of incense where the prayers go up directly before the throne of God right outside of the veil that separates it from the holy place, the holy of holies, where the throne of God rests on the mercy seat between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, standing right before the presence of God. Or a young girl, probably between 14 and 16 years old, in her house, no theological training, but God knew her heart. A young girl, morally pure, a young girl sold out to the God of Israel, a young girl who would respond with puzzlement, but with faith. And the angel appears to her and says, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. The Lord is with thee. He's with you too. Jesus promised it. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you live that? Do you sense that? Do you feel that at every moment? The Lord is with you? He's with you wherever you go. He sees you. He hears you. He knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among all the peoples of the earth. The Lord is with you. I suspect it was a surprise to Mary to suddenly have a shining angel standing in her house. It says so. It says when she saw him, she was troubled, but she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. I think you might have been afraid. I would have been. 
And that's why the angel says to her, fear not. That's one of the most beautiful phrases in all of Scripture. It occurs over and over and over again. We find fear not, fear not. God had to say it even to the shepherds out in the fields. Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. We get to that in chapter 2. Uh, we're people of fear. But God brings us glad tidings of great joy. He had brought glad tidings to Zacharias, but Zacharias, it doesn't say, was a man of faith. He doubted. Mary was afraid, but she believed. She merely asked for information. And the angel said to her, here's how it will happen. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. You remember that's where our passage started. It said, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. The sixth month after Elizabeth had conceived. Month five is mentioned in the immediate preceding verse, verse 24. Elizabeth hid herself five months, saying, and then... In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth. And here was a young virgin, a girl. Any commentary you read will tell you that she was probably between 14 and 16 years old, never been to seminary, never memorized the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, Never had been through all the rigorous studies that the boys had to do for their bar mitzvahs. She was a girl. But she was totally, 100% sold out to the God of Israel. Did it ever occur to you that God had planned everything from the casting of the lots and the conception at exactly the precise time of John the Baptist to give that six-month lead for a young woman who was espoused, betrothed to be married, but not yet married, because God, in the fullness of time, sent forth his son, made of a virgin, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. There was a precise point in history where God reached down and touched the lives of two couples in a miraculous way. One to be the forerunner prophesied in Malachi chapter 4, one to be the promised Messiah, the sinless Savior of the world in the fullness of time. We stand 2,000 years later looking back but also looking forward because the angel told Mary, you're going to bear a Savior one who will save his people from their sins. He died for us. He rose for us. He's coming for us. We look back. We live now, and I hope as Mary did, and we look for the coming Savior. What a thrill it is to know that the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Mashiach, the Christos, is ours, not merely at Christmas. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's our Jesus. Are you like Zacharias? You know all the theology. 
you've sat in this church or some other church if you're visiting with us tonight. For many, many years, you've heard many sermons. You've learned the theology. You've learned the Christian lifestyle. You've learned all the things that Zacharias would have learned. You've participated in the activities. You've even perhaps held office, as did Zacharias. But when the test comes, you doubt. Oh, that we might be more like Mary, an excited young girl looking forward to her wedding, a young girl who was thrilled to be a mother in Israel at some point, but not knowing that she would be the mother of the Messiah until God revealed it to her. And she responded with 100% faith. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Simple, childlike faith. One young woman in the history of the world who said yes to God and it changed the entire scope of eternity. Who will you be like? Zacharias or Mary? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this lesson of faith, a Christmas lesson, a lesson that reminds us that the Messiah has come and he shall indeed feed his flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs in his arms and carry them gently in his bosom Father how we thank you for our Messiah Jesus Christ the Savior who's coming into this world gives to us through faith in him, the one who died for our sins was buried and rose again the virgin born son of God who gives to us eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.
everybody get a chance to put their suggestions in the box on our history of the town. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Of the Father's love begotten. What child is this? And O come, O come, Emmanuel. All right, so I'm going to take the three of these and just blend them together. Give me a second. I'm going to set up registration and my stops and everything.
And all of God's people said, Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the glory of music. That heaven is filled with music, with your praise, the angelic choirs. Oh, Father, how we look forward to that day when someday we will be with you. And hearing the music of heaven, and we've heard a little taste of it tonight. And we thank you for that. We pray that you will encourage our hearts to desire your will, your way, to walk by faith, to trust you when things seem impossible, to glory in Christ, the one who is our Redeemer. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and ever. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you so much for coming. Please greet your neighbors, and do not forget there are refreshments, and there is a...